Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. My name is Jack Mulder. I teach philosophy at Hope College, and I'm also the assistant director for the, the St. Benedict Institute, the organization responsible for putting this event together, together with co-sponsors, the Center for Ministry Studies and the Religion Department. The St. Benedict Institute is a ministry of the local Catholic Church, St. Francis de Sales. The St. Benedict Institute has a threefold mission, spiritual, intellectual, and ecumenical. In focusing on the thought of St. Augustine, uh, tonight's event helps to fulfill each portion of that mission. St. Augustine's uh, famous confessions, on which Dr. Ortiz uh, focuses uh, tonight, has sometimes been described as one long prayer. Augustine's deeply biblical, deeply prayerful, and deeply pastoral mind led him to compose this prayer. A neglected but supremely significant part of prayer is contemplation. Plumbing the depths of God and his purposes for us in creation is itself a prayer, if St. John of Damascus is right, that prayer is the raising of the mind and heart to God. But Augustine's heart is deeply pastoral as well. He teaches us the fruits of his own prayer life so that we too might taste and see the goodness of God. He also treasures the sacramental life of the church and prays for her unity amid the many controversies of his day. Along with St. Benedict himself, Augustine is a wonderful exemplar for the St. Benedict Institute. From his first days at Hope College, Jared Ortiz has imitated his master in each of these ways. There's wonderful beauty and grandeur in the Catholic tradition, and to embrace that beauty in its fullness is, to, is also to embrace a robust faith identity that is unfortunately countercultural in our day. From the beginning, Jared has seen this and sought to give our Catholic students the spiritual and intellectual resources they need to love their holy mother, the church. Part of the mission of the St. Benedict Institute is to make these riches of the church available to Hope College and the wider community to renew the culture from within. Upon his arrival, Jared pursued this vision instinctively by first of all making friends. It is, after all, as profoundly true as it is disarmingly simple with apologies to the grateful dead that a friend of Jesus is a friend of mine. <laughs> I'm pleased to have been among the first uh, to have been privileged to call Jared a friend, and I've learned so much from him. Our community has been made much better for his presence within it and his vision for it. Jared's topic tonight is, You Made Us For Yourself, Creation, Worship, and Human Destiny in St. Augustine. Please join me in welcoming our friend, Jared Ortiz. Thank you, Jack, for that uh, generous, warm introduction, and thank you all for coming out. We set out 100 chairs, and we didn't think we would fill them, and we had to set out more, and that was a beautiful uh, thing. And Jeff Tyler said, and you're not even talking about sex, and we need more chairs. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, uh, it is beautiful to see so many people come out uh, for a St. Benedict Institute event. Jack and I started this institute three years ago. Uh, with just a dollar and a dream, and our friend Tony Castillo uh, took, a, took a risk on us and helped us get started, and now here we are, and so it's a real blessing to have you all here tonight. To Augustine. So Augustine has two very famous sayings. Both come from his book, The Confessions. Both are prayers. The first he prayed when he was a sinner. The second he prayed when he was a saint. The first goes like this. Lord, give me chastity and continence, but not yet. <laughs> College students tend to like this one. <laughs> the other is, you made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. It is this latter prayer that I'd like to focus on today because it is this latter prayer which I believe contains the heart of Augustine's whole theology, which helps us to understand his most famous book, The Confessions, and which is the central truth of the Christian life. There are three parts to this famous prayer which roughly correspond to the three parts of the title of my talk, 
you made us, obviously corresponds to creation. Second, the phrase, and our heart is restless, interestingly enough, is a subtle reference to the liturgy, to Christian worship, where the priest would say, lift up your heart during the prayers of the Eucharist. Third, there are two phrases that speak to human destiny. The for yourself part of you made us for yourself, and the phrase until it rests in you. Both of these refer to our final destiny, when we will have union with God, when we will enter God's eternal Sabbath rest, and when God will completely deify us, and we will be at rest in him. That word deify or deification is weird for some people, but for Augustine, it means that God wants to share his very being with us. He wants to make us what he is. And to put it biblically, God wants to be all in all. What I would like to explore in this talk is how creation, worship, and human destiny fit together in Augustine's thought and in his life. How, for Augustine, we are created with an inbuilt trajectory toward God. How our destiny is to be permeated with the presence of God. And how the way to achieve this is through worship, particularly through the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist. If I had to put my argument into one sentence, I would say this. Creation is dynamically ordered toward deification through Christian worship. Before we dive into Augustine's rich theology, it'll be helpful to know a little bit about his life for those of us who are unfamiliar with it. Much of what we know about his life comes from the Confessions. This book is an extended prayer to God in which Augustine, among other things, tells the story of how God brought him from a life of ambition and dissipation to a life transformed in Christ. In other words, the Confessions tells the story of Augustine's conversion. Augustine was born in the year 354 in Roman North Africa to a pagan father and a saintly Christian mother, Monica. He was a pious youth, but also mischievous and too smart for his own good. He became proud and rebellious, and while advancing in the world, he became somewhat dissolute in his private life. He liked women a lot, but eventually settled down with a live-in girlfriend and at the age of 17 had a child out of wedlock. He was ambitious and climbed the social ladder, and by his late 20s, he was poised to become the chief rhetorician of the empire, the official propagandist for the emperor. Augustine was also a seeker, a lover of truth, but we didn't know where to find that truth. He burned with questions. Why is there evil? What is God really like? What is the best way to live? He loved philosophy, but bounced from one materialist philosophical system to another. Religiously, he fell away from his mother's Catholic Christian faith and became a manichae, a quasi-Christian religious sect which held a dualist vision of the world as divided between equal forces of light and darkness. A devotee of Star Wars, basically, in other words. <laughs> Throughout all of this, Augustine was unhappy. His heart was restless. Eventually, he became disillusioned with the Manichees, but he was skeptical of the Catholic Church he thought their scriptures were vulgar, and their people were backward, superstitious, and anti-intellectual. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Anyway. <clears throat> but he didn't have anywhere else to go, so he reluctantly decided to become a catechumen in the church and see if anything might open up for him. He tells us that God providentially put into his hands the books of the Platonist philosophers, and that through this reading he learned the truth about the nature of God, and the nature of creation. After that, so many of the intellectual difficulties he had before began to melt away in the light of God and the truth about God. He decided that he not only wanted to join the church, but devote his whole life to God, in particular to follow St. Paul in living a celibate life. But he was, he tells us, still tightly bound by the love of women. And whenever he thought of becoming a eunuch for the kingdom of God, his lovers of old, Trifles of trifles, vanity of vanities held me back. They plucked at my fleshly garment. 
he says, and whispered softly, do you cast us off? From the moment you renounce us, no longer will this thing or that thing be allowed to you forever and ever. With a great show of willpower, Augustine struggled to give up his old way of life, but his will had been damaged by a lifetime of moral compromise, and so he couldn't accomplish what he wanted to accomplish, to have a whole will directed toward God. This struggle came to a crisis in a garden at Milan, the garden, a symbol of paradise and of the church, where in despair over his inability to devote himself to God, he starts to weep. In the midst of his tears, he hears children playing a game next door, and they start singing, Tola lege, tola lege, take and read, take and read. Augustine interprets this as a divine command, runs inside, opens the scriptures at random, and falls upon this passage from Paul's letter to the Romans, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in debauchery and lewdness, not in strife and envying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh or the gratification of your desires. And then Augustine tells us, no sooner had I reached the end of the verse then the light of certainty flooded my heart, and all the dark shades of doubt fled away. The following Easter, Augustine, his now teenage son, and a few friends put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, they were baptized into the church. Now that's as much of the story as Augustine tells us in the Confessions, and we know that after his baptism, he founded a lay monastic community called the Servi Dei, the Servants of God, who devoted themselves to prayer, fasting, good works, and study. He did this for several years before he was forced, very much against his desires, to become a priest. A few years later, he became the Bishop of Hippo, a small North African port town, and one of his first acts as bishop was to write the Confessions which, he says, was written in order to stir up the human mind and heart into God. When Augustine wrote his famous line about our heart being restless until it rests in God, he wrote from experience. But this restlessness needs to be understood properly. This restlessness is the way that God created us. And so now we need to turn and think about Augustine's theology of creation to see how that works. So Augustine's understanding of creation is foundational for his whole thought. It's the context of his whole theology. So what does creation mean? For Augustine, the term creation can refer to all the stuff that God has made, both material and spiritual. It can refer to the act of bringing all things into being from nothing. But in his confessions, there is a deeper sense in which Augustine uses creation. Creation is a revelation. Following St. Paul in Romans 1.20, Augustine thinks that the invisible things of God are understood through the things that are made. That which God has made is a whole, a coherent world of creatures which operates as a harmonious system. It is a cosmos, a beautifully ordered hierarchy of things, each of which has its own integrity, but which mutually depends on other things. Augustine's world is a, di a dynamic one, where all things are in purposeful motion. God is the creator of this whole, and therefore cannot be a part of it. For Augustine, this means that creation itself, its very existence, is revelation. And this is on your sheet. With the whole creation testifying together, with the whole creation testifying together, Augustine says, I found you, our creator, and your word, God with you, and with you one God through whom you created all things. All of creation unfailingly proclaims that it is not God, but that God made it. God cannot be identified with any part of his creation, not even the highest part, nor can, be, can he be identified with the whole. Rather, the whole, made up of parts, confesses, I am not God, but God has made me. For Augustine, creation as a whole is epiphany. It is an illumination which not only sheds light on, but determines our understanding of the Creator, what and how he creates, and how his creation is distinct from and related to him. <clears throat> 
Creation, in this deep Pauline sense, is determinative of Augustine's thought. And, moreover, it opens up the conceptual space to understand the other Christian mysteries, such as the Incarnation and the Trinity. For Augustine, God is not a part of creation, but the ontologically distinct creator of it. Now, this seeming truism, which can be found in any catechism, is not as obvious as it might seem. It certainly wasn't obvious to the young Augustine. For there is a perennial human temptation to reduce God to another being in the world. When we want to think about God, we often unwittingly imagine him. That is, we make an image of him, and whenever we do, we reduce him to something within the horizon of the world. So, for example, Augustine tells the story about people who ask, what was God doing before he created the world? And Augustine relates how the common answer was making hell for people who ask questions like that. <laughs> but Augustine didn't like that answer. Serious questions deserve serious answers. Augustine also talks about those who imagine God as a great being who creates at a distance from himself, as if the universe were a big blank canvas and God stood before it like an artist and created. Those who think such things make God subject to time and space. Asking what God was doing before creation puts God on the timeline of creation. Imagining God standing apart from the canvas makes him a part of the created universe. Instead of understanding God as the transcendent source of creation, these people understand God as the highest thing in creation. That is, they make him a being among other beings, albeit a great and powerful one. On these accounts, creation contains God, rather than God containing all creation. But this is not right, Augustine says. And this quote is on your sheet as well. Augustine says, God does not exist in a certain way, but he is, is. Non aluquamoro est, sed est, est. Notice this weird sentence. It's weird in Latin, it's weird in English. How Augustine uses the word is back to back. God is, is. By reduplicating this word is, Augustine invokes Exodus 3.14. God's revelation of his name as I am who am, and suggests that God is simply, without qualification. All creatures exist in a certain way, the way God made them. So our being is limited by what we are. I am a human being, not a very good one. I am a human being, and I have my being as a human. That tree outside has its being limited in a different way, tree being, if you will. And the same is true of the squirrel and the moon and the amoeba. All exist in a particular way. But God is not a part of creation, so he does not exist in a particular way, or in a certain way, or as a certain kind of thing. God is, is itself. Sheer is. Because creation arises ex nihilo, from nothing, it is both distinct from God and initially unlike God. Creation doesn't share the being of God, the substance of God, in the way that, say, his son does, where we say in the creed that Jesus is consubstantial with the Father. He share, he's the same substance as the Father. So creation is not the same substance as the Father because it's created from nothing. But for, for Augustine, creation can only be like God if creation turns back to God. If, in Augustine's word, words, creation converts. Through a close and careful reading of Genesis 1, Augustine discerns that God creates all things from nothing in a threefold, simultaneous, trinitarian act, which he describes under the terms creatio, conversio, and formatio, creation, conversion, formation. Just sounds cooler in Latin. Creatio, conversio, formatio. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was formless and void. For Augustine, this refers to the creation of formless matter from nothing. God calls this formless matter back to himself through his word. Let there be light. 
This calling back through the word constitutes the conversion of formless matter from unlikeness to God to some kind of likeness. All of creation, then, has a kind of conversion torque, a dynamic orientation toward the Creator, which is constitutive of its very being. In the Holy Spirit, the formless creature simultaneously, simultaneously receives its form as whatever it's supposed to be. And there was light. God said, let there be light, and there was light. In this conversion and formation, Augustine says, the creature, in its own way, imitates God the Word. For rational creatures, formation, formatio, means illumination, which Augustine says means being made in God's image and likeness, and having the capacity to participate in the light of God's wisdom. Now, while human beings can never lose the image of God, they can deform it by sinning and so become unlike God. For Augustine, his theology of creation forms the essential context for his understanding of sin. Augustine follows Paul, again, in saying that sin means preferring creation to the Creator, Romans 1.25. Sin is a disorder, he says on your sheet. It's a disorder of man and a perversity, that is, an aversion, an aversio, from the most excellent Creator and a conversion toward inferior creations. Sin, or aversio, or turning away from God, is utterly incoherent. It arises from the creature tacitly denying his creaturehood and his dependence on God. Instead of turning to God as the source of our existence, the creature desires to be the source of himself and attempts to turn himself into God, thereby distorting the very distinction which defines him. This is also on the sheet for those who have it. Whence this aversion, Augustine says, unless someone whose good is God wants to be his own good by his own self, just as if he were God to himself. The sinner can recognize the distinction between God and the world, God and creation, but he chooses against it. The sinner perversely imitates not only God, but the act of salvation. All human beings, as I said in the very opening, all human beings are destined to be changed into God, to be healed of sin, to be made whole, to be elevated to union with the divine nature. But by making himself into God, the sinner perversely inserts himself into this process, transforming himself into a God, distorting the good, and elevating himself, just as if he were God to himself. Eat this fruit the serpent says, and your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. Sin for Augustine is a moral decision, which has consequences for our being. There's no way to separate the ethical from the ontological for Augustine. Sin is an evil rooted in the will, which turns away from true being, and therefore from the true good. The rational creature who chooses lesser things becomes less himself. The sinner diminishes his existence. He falls away and tends toward nothing. In a very real sense for Augustine, the sinner unmakes or decreates himself. For Augustine, sin undoes the order and unity of the human being. He says that when humans sin, they turn away from God aversio instead of conversio, and this distorts their very selves. The language he uses is striking, and this is on the sheet. With you our good always lives, because when we are averted, we are perverted. Let us revert, even now, that we, may, we might not be everted. When we are turned away, we are turned over, turned through, mixed up. Let us turn back even now so that we might not be turned out. 
By sinning, human beings disorder the ordering within them. They undo God's creative work as they, in a sense, fall backwards through the process of creation. Human beings are creatures called from a primordial formlessness, converted through the Word and illumined by the Holy Spirit. In sinning, they turn away from the light and plunge themselves toward the formlessness from which they were made. Since conversion is constitutive of their being, sin is not just a moral aversion from God, but a perversion of their very ontological makeup. The result of sin is deformation, and therefore disintegration. What God has beautifully ordered and held together in his creature is undone and jumbled through sin. So this is the deep truth, this is the deep reality for Augustine, undergirding all of our experience. And so now that we have some sense of Augustine's thought, what I want to do is revisit that conversion story I told you in the beginning, Augustine's conversion, to see how this theology of creation can illumine it. And as we'll see, this is also going to shed light on Augustine's understanding of worship and of our human destiny. In Book 7 of the Confessions, Augustine tells us that he recently separated himself from the Manichees and has become a somewhat despondent catechumen in the Catholic Church. For the previous nine years, Augustine had labored under the Manichaean notion of two eternal substances, both material and at war, whose mingling begot the world. In a rather striking way, the Manichaeans confused, indeed seemingly identified, creator and creation. But all this changes for Augustine when he reads the books of the Platonists. With divine help, Augustine is inspired by the Platonist books to attempt a spiritual ascent from created things to their creator. Being thus admonished to return to myself, he says, under your leadership I entered into my inmost being. This I could do, for you became my helper. This ascent does not begin with Augustine's own personal initiative, but is entirely situated in the context of grace. Augustine withdraws his attention from the world of bodily senses and enters into his own soul, where he sees an unchangeable light above the eye of my soul, above my mind. It's different from the light he sees with his eyes. It's not simply a brighter version of natural light. He sees this light as above him, not by space or intensity, but, he says, because this light made me. And I was beneath it because I was made by it. Creation. Creation makes the difference. Creation is epiphany. It is creation that reveals the truth about God and himself. Augustine learns from the Platonists that God is not the highest thing in the world, nor is he identical to the world. Rather, God is, the ontologically, God is ontologically distinct from the world, the transcendent creator of it, and moreover, the creator of Augustine himself. This ontological distinction between God and Augustine, this distinction in their being, is a revelation itself. It reveals for Augustine the necessity of the Incarnation. In one of the most remarkable passages in the Confessions, it's actually the central passage of the central book. I think it's actually the heart of the whole book. And this is on your sheet. Augustine says, When I first knew you, you took me up toward yourself, so that I might see that what I saw is, and that I who saw am not yet. And you beat back the weakness of my sight, radiating in me most powerfully, and I trembled with love and horror. And I found myself to be far from you, in a region of unlikeness, as if I heard your voice from on high, saying, I am the food of grown men. Increase, and you will eat me. You will not change me into you, as food of your flesh, but you will be changed into me. In shockingly brief compass, Augustine goes from creation as revealing the distinction between God and the world, God and creation, to deification through the sacraments as the destiny of fallen man. Let's look at this passage more closely. Augustine says that God took him up toward himself. And the Latin word here is absumere. For Augustine, this is incarnation language. 
When the Word became flesh, the Word assumed man. He took him up. The use of the word here suggests that something Christologically transforming is happening. The deifying process is begun. God is reforming the image of God in Augustine by illuminating his mind, by giving him new and true memories of God. When God takes him up, Augustine is shown that God is true being, and that he, Augustine, is what is called in philosophy participated being. Augustine sees that God is, and that he, Augustine, is not yet. But this word, yet, is hopeful. It suggests a recognition that participated being is somehow ordered toward true being, toward that which brought it into being. And Augustine discovers he is in a region of unlikeness, that there's this tremendous gulf between his created being and the creator, who is being itself. Only the eternally begotten Son is perfectly like the Father. Everything else, everything else that is created is unlike God because it doesn't perfectly reflect his substance. The discovery of the ontological unlikeness between God and Augustine reveals itself as a Christological insight. And this is suggested by that little phrase, as if. And I found myself to be far from you in a region of unlikeness. Augustine discovers he's in this, un is this region of unlikeness. He says, I am unlike God. And this comes to him as if I heard your voice from on high. In this region of unlikeness, God speaks to him. Or it's as if God spoke to him. I am the food of grown men. Increase and you will eat me, says God. Augustine's great in graced insight into creation impresses a Christological, even Eucharistic insight on his soul. God is being itself and Augustine is not. This fact comes as the revelation that our destiny is to become God. Creation points directly to deification. And the way is by eating God. For Augustine, this is incarnation and Eucharist language. And by Eucharist, uh, I find some of my students don't know this word, referring to the Lord's Supper, communion, the consecrated bread and wine. For Augustine, to eat God is to take in his truth. But instead of destroying it and assimilating it to ourselves, we are assimilated into it. We cannot change the truth. The truth changes us. We assimilate by being assimilated. This is because God is not a kind of being, but being itself. He is not the kind of thing that can be changed, because he is not a kind. Therefore, God changes whatever comes into contact with him. When God is consumed, the consumer is changed, transformed because he now participates more in God. When Augustine eats God in the Eucharist, the bread is assimilated to his body, but Augustine is assimilated to God. Instead of God coursing through our veins, we course through his Augustine's reading of the Platonist books was indeed profound. It resulted in a true knowledge of God and creation, and also an intuition about salvation, in particular, salvation understood as deification through Christ in the church. The result for Augustine is that for the first time in his life, he not only knows God truly, but also truly loves him. Augustine's mind is converted, his heart, his love is converted, but his will is still stuck. His will is converted, as I mentioned above, in the Garden of Milan. And so let's look at this garden scene again to see how creation and deification are at play here as well. In our discussion of creation, we noted the idea of conversion, that conversion plays a fundamental role. For Augustine, formless matter is converted to God through the calling back of the word. Now in the garden scene, Augustine is speaking not of his creational conversion to God, but of his moral conversion. But the very fact that Augustine is speaking of conversion at all puts this narrative in the context of creation. 
All conversions, according to Augustine, have their foundation in God's original creative act. For God recreates in the same way he creates. In sinning, we have turned away from God, aversio instead of conversio. We unmake ourselves and therefore deform the image of God in us. We dissipate the unity of our being, which makes us like the formless abyss out of which we were created. But God calls us back again through the word, now incarnate, who converts us and in the spirit reforms us after the pattern of our original creation. In Book 8 of the Confessions, Augustine presents a kind of interior view of this converting and reforming trinity who calls Augustine to enter into the word, that perfect image of God toward which he was made. Now, Book 8 begins with Augustine hearing a number of conversion stories, the conversion of the pagan philosopher Marius Victorinus, who sacrificed station and prestige to become a Christian, the conversion of Anthony of Egypt, who after hearing the gospel call to leave all and follow Christ, renounced his worldly goods and embarked on the monastic life in the desert. The conversion of two government officials who left their powerful positions and their fiancés to become celibate monks. After hearing these stories, Augustine says, he was on fire for imitating them. He struggles to imitate them, but he can't. This is when he breaks down, and he weeps, and he hears the children playing, and he reads the scriptures, and he's flooded with light. And so what has happened in that scene? The Word, the Logos, Christ, being imitated by others, prepares Augustine to hear the Word speaking through the children's words, which leads Augustine to the Word of Scripture which leads to the Word made flesh. In each of these temporal events, the unchanging Word beckons Augustine to conversion, to increase likeness to Christ. When Augustine hears the children call, take and read, he remembers Anthony's conversion and is moved to imitate him. And this detail sheds light on the mechanics of how creation is operative in Augustine's conversion. The examples put before Augustine form his memory so that he begins not to be conformed to this world, but reformed in his mind, as St. Paul says. Thus, St. Paul says again, a man is renewed in the knowledge of God according to the image of him who created him. The imitators of Christ, those already converted, the imitators of Christ participate in the light, and thus they become a light which can shed light for others. By providing new light-filled memories, these examples illumine Augustine's mind so that he can see the world in a new light. The process of reformatio is advanced. Augustine is now able to rightly interpret the children's words. He interprets them as a divine command to read the scriptures. And when he sees the way in the call of the scriptural word, he is further illumined. It was, he says, as if a light of surety was infused in my heart. Augustine is exhorted to put on Christ, to be baptized, which will incorporate him into the body of Christ, drawing him ever closer to that image toward which he was made. Now, most people think this powerful story is really the center of Augustine's life and thought. And while clearly important and justly famous, Augustine would not locate the center in this private experience of conversion, but rather in the public experience of conversion, namely his baptism by Ambrose. Further, for Augustine, baptism is not the end, but the beginning, because baptism is ordered toward the Eucharist, toward deeper and continuing union with God and transformation into him. So Augustine's conversion and reformation are not finished in the garden. So we have to now consider the more important sacramental dimension, which confirms that process begun there and advances it throughout his life. 
Augustine's understanding of the sacraments is really quite beautiful. For Augustine, each sacramental mystery illumines the other, and he often suggests that there's not only a symbolic relationship, but also a kind of mystical identity between the baptized congregation and the Eucharist. Following a tradition which goes back to New Testament times, Augustine compares the process of making the Eucharist to the process the catechumens undergo as they prepare for incorporation into the church. The congregation, he says, is like scattered grain which is gathered together, which is ground in exorcisms, which separates the wheat from the chaff, separates the sinner from the devil. Mixed with the water of baptism, baked with the fire of the Holy Spirit in confirmation, and transformed into the Eucharistic bread. But this symbolic element is in no way separated from the reality which it signifies. In baptism, we are truly incorporated into the body of Christ. In the Eucharist, the bread truly becomes the body of Christ. Augustine tells his congregation, and this beautiful quote is on your sheet, he tells his congregation, so if you are the body of Christ and its members, it is your mystery that has been placed on the Lord's table. You receive your own mystery. Be what you see and receive what you are. In the celebration of the Eucharist, the congregation offers itself up on the altar along with the bread and the wine. The body of Christ the baptized congregation, offers itself along with and precisely as the perfect sacrifice of the body of Christ, the Eucharist. The congregation conforms itself to the sacrament of redemption while the sacrament brings about the redemption of the congregation. In the prayers leading up to the Eucharist, the priest says, lift up your heart, and the people say, we hold it up to the Lord. Augustine says, when our heart is up to the Lord, it is his altar. As we lift up our heart to God in the Eucharistic liturgy, it becomes an altar on which we offer ourselves back to God as the body of Christ. Lift up your heart, Augustine says. This is the whole life of true Christians. Lift up your heart. In this motion, our hearts become one heart, in which we offer the one sacrifice of ourselves, mystically identical to the sacrifice of bread and wine on the altar. In doing this, we give back to God what he has already given us, everything. By partaking of the Eucharist, we become what we receive, namely Christ. We are inserted into Christ's perfect self-offering to the Father, and so we ourselves also become an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. This motion of creation transformed in the church and offered up to God can also be seen in Augustine's most famous line, you made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. We are created so that nothing can satisfy us fully except God himself. The restless heart, the one heart of the body of Christ, begins to find rest when the Holy Spirit transforms it through worship, when our heart is lifted up in self-offering, when it confesses to God and praise and thanksgiving. It is only through the body of Christ that we can offer true worship, for then it is Christ who worships in us. Through this worship, we advance the mysterious process of changing into God. This process of Christological transformation is begun now, but will only be completed when creation is deified, when God will be all in all, and when all creation will be at rest in God in a perpetual Sabbath. People often wonder why Augustine ends his confessions with three books on Genesis, and especially why he ends his last book with a discussion of our eternal Sabbath rest, prefigured by the seventh day of creation. But perhaps our discussion has already suggested the reason for this. Creation is dynamically ordered towards God. The six days of creation culminate in the seventh day, the Sabbath, a peace without evening, which Augustine says 
is God himself. The Sabbath, God himself, hovers over the confessions. He hovers over creation and history, and he hovers over their recreation. God draws all things toward himself. He made us converted toward himself and for himself. He made us to eat him and to be transformed into him. And this is written into the very structure of our dynamic created being. The church, both divine and human, is the place where creation becomes a new creation, where creation is transformed into God. Baptism incorporates us into the body of Christ while the Eucharist conforms us to the heart of that body. And it's this ecclesial heart which was created for God and longs for rest. This rest is begun in this life and will be accomplished in the next when the church, like the bread and wine, is definitively taken up and changed into God. The church, both nourished by and mystically identical to the Eucharist, will be transformed into what she eats. Our transformation, our deification, has the incarnation as its model. Just as God became man without ceasing to be God, so too do we become gods without ceasing to be human. And this is our destiny as human beings, which was revealed to Augustine when he first came to the truth about creation. And God told him, I am the food of grown men. Increase, and you will eat me. You will not change me into you as food for your flesh but you will be changed into me. Thank you. So totally obscure and obnoxious, but uh, happy to take some questions if uh, for a few minutes. <clears throat> Dr. Pennings. I, I can identify with Augustine in the sense that I also have this kind of a yearning or this restlessness that seems like we're trying to cause. The problem is, I don't know which is the cause and which is the effect. Is it God that causes this restlessness, or is it this restlessness that humans have that have given rise to the idea of God. It seems like either one of those could, could be possible. It's hard to, hard to tell which, which one might be true. However, the rest of your talk seems like it might give a hint. And that's the part that bothers me. Because it's this super smart dude, Augustine, this philosopher, this person who can think heavy, deep thoughts, complicated thoughts, who comes up with all these very personal truths about God. And it's a matter of us finding God because that's this inclination in us and we're kind of creating God. That's kind of what you'd expect to happen. You'd expect this very sharp person in history to be given us these truths. On the other hand, if God existed and God is revealing God's self to us, then it's, it's not quite so clear that it's this one sharp person who gets all these deep personal revelations of God and passes them down to us. <laughs> so did we, did we make up God or did God make up us? Uh, yeah, I don't know, what would Augustine say? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a, a couple of responses to that. I mean, so one, on the one hand, these are, this is a very deeply personal story that Augustine tells uh, in the Confessions, but he also offers it as the story of every man. And what he discovers is not some kind of um, personal private truth. What he, what he says is that the truth is public, the truth is common, and the truth is not diminished by me uh, discovering it, right? So, and I mean, that was uh, one of the lines I had there, uh, you know, reflecting on 
changing into God versus God changing into us, right? So if it is just this really brilliant guy, you know, making up cool stuff, right, then what is he doing? He's conforming the truth to himself, right? Um, where that doesn't seem to be his experience, what he discovers is that there is this something transcendent, something that he can't manipulate, right? His whole life he's manipulating stuff, he's so smart. And this is what smart people do, right? We control things through our mind, right? Um, and eventually we, we come to a point where we can't do that, and that's the beginning of humility. Um, and we realize that God is that thing that can't be manipulated. God's that thing that can't be changed, but God is that thing that changes us. So I think continuity would be the wrong way of thinking about it, because um, again, I think that would, we would end up putting God back in the world. I think that would be the danger of the continuity. So yeah, I mean, I think there is, on the one hand, this, this radical gulf, this radical separation between God and the world. But in some ways, I mean, uh, as I said at the end, the model for overcoming that is the incarnation, right? Because God unites himself personally to his creation, to the high point of his creation the human being who's a microcosm of all creation because human beings contain uh, both material and spiritual reality so we're, we're kind of a microcosm, a mini cosmos, right? So we kind of sum up all of creation. And so God unites himself to that, right? Um, and when he does that, right, it's, it's beautiful to think that, you know, when God becomes man, he doesn't obliterate man. You know, man doesn't become a drop in the ocean of God that becomes dissolved, right? But that human beings, uh, the man, are, uh, is perfected through that, right? Um, so this is part of what uh, we need, the transcendence of God, in order to understand deification properly, right? Because God is not in competition with his creation, right? So, um, right, so is there a limit? On the one hand, uh, sure. I mean, the biggest difference is, you know, that God is uncreated and we're created, right? So there is something certainly finite about us. On the other hand, God really wants to communicate his self to us. He really wants to unite himself to us, right? And so we probably have some finite capacity to receive that. Um, the, uh, the, the, the fathers, Augustine doesn't use this image, um, but other early Christians do, uh, and my students are very familiar with this image, of the iron and the fire, right? So the iron is cold and hard. Right? Uh, but when it's put in the fire long enough, it takes on all the qualities of fire, right? It's permeated with fire. And so when you look at that iron again, right, it acts like fire, it feels like fire, it burns like fire, right? And that's what God wants to do to us, right? When we're united to God, he wants to permeate us with his being, you know, with his love, with immortality, with in incorruption, uh, with joy, with blessedness, with all those things that are, are part of God's nature, to take us into his communion, his eternal communion of love. Right? And so our being gets permeated with that, right? So that all of our thoughts, all of our feelings, all of our breathing, all of our being, all of our body, all of our soul is breathing, thinking, being, feeling God. Master Phelps. As a follow-up to that, I wonder, does, um, what does Aquinas say, if anything, about Christ's role in sort of writing the ship. So you talk about you know, creation, especially rational creatures, turning from God towards the created good. And um, how, what is the role of Christ in his incarnation in relation to the Eucharist in <clears throat> even giving us the possibility of converting back towards God? Um, because it'd be easy to, I think, misconstrue uh, the idea is you've said saying like, oh, well, we're, we're, we're oriented this way naturally, so all we have to do as rational creatures is recognize it. But it seems to me that the deification is predicated on the incarnation now. 
So can you say a little more about Christ entering into the creation that has turned and not turned back? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I mean, we do have this inbuilt trajectory toward God, and I think that's right. I think Augustine's right on that. Um, and we always uh, end up shooting wrong, right? So, you know, we're seeking God, and then we're like, oh, I think this is going to work. Oh, I think that's going to work. Oh, I think this is ultimate, right? And that's uh, what we do. And the more we do that, the more our heart becomes damaged, and the more our mind becomes clouded, right? So for Augustine, yeah, part of what the Incarnation does is um, it does a couple of things. It's interesting because when he, he reads those Plainness books, I kind of uh, skimmed over this part, uh, he comes to this truth about God, and he loves God, but he falls into pride right away. And he says, ah, I finally got it. I'm smart. I finally got it. <laughs> and so at the very point of recognizing God, he distances himself from God. Right? And that's his main critique of the Platonists. Right? He says, they get God right. right. They get God exactly right. They understand Father and Son. They get God right. These philosophers, they get God right. He says that. Uh, he says, but they, they stray from God because they too fall into pride because they don't recognize the humility of the Incarnation. Right? And so that's the essential part. Right? So part of what uh, happens when God becomes man is he gives us a model of humility which heals our mind. Right? And so the Platonists can see the, the end, they can see the destination, they can see the goal, they say, ah, God, bright, beautiful, burning light, right? but they have no idea how to get there. Right? And when Christ comes, he gives us the way to get there. Right? And the way is this way of humility, right? which, um, which has two parts, I think, humbling our hearts and humbling our minds. Oh, yes, so many good people on our document. Master Banner, please. Uh, Kathleen. So is there, that was the gain of the incarnation. Is there anything gained in the fall? I think of Milton, if that was cool, a portion of fall. If, if we're returning to the way we originally ordered and created, eschatologically, however you want to talk about it, is there something gained in the fall for Augustine? Where's Dr. Counselor Komla? She can answer this question. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, that's a good question, right? I mean, oh, happy fault, right? That one is such a redeemer, right? So we wouldn't have Christ without the fall. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't think so. I don't think this is, I don't think for Augustine it's a, it's a happy fault, you know. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, his understanding of creation and then what Christ does um, is um, when, when Christ, when we're restored, right, um, we actually go beyond what we were in the garden. So the garden is not the end. So Adam and Eve, with the way they're created in holiness and in harmony with God, but that's the beginning, right? There's still farther for them to go, you know, uh, I think for Augustine and for most of the tradition, um, at least the Western tradition. Uh, so this restoration back, Right, uh, is, is a healing. We come back to this kind of original state of, of innocence and, and harmony with God. But Christ takes us beyond that. So, anyway, Kathleen? Um, as you were talking, I was thinking of a story by John Updike called Augustine's Concubine. And it's a story that tells us a lot more about Updike. <laughs> as most writings on Augustine do, by the way. Yeah. Augustine gets a really bad rap uh, on sex, and um, I'm sure there's parts where he's, he says bad things about sex. 
Um, but I've actually found him, I always found him to be incredibly sensible. Uh, so we'll start with the concubine, right? So Augustine had this live-in girlfriend, concubine, common law, wife, for more than 10 years, and he deeply loved her. He deeply loved her, and, and his mother made him put, him, put her away because she wasn't noble enough, and he was going to marry up because he was going to be this big rhetorician. And he says, when, when we put her away, he said it was like ripping my flesh off. And a lot of people criticize Augustine. They're like, oh, he couldn't even mention her name, and you know, he's so terrible. She's just this nameless. And I think he, he doesn't name her out of delicacy and out of concern for her. I think she became a nun, actually. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, telling your sexual exploits of this holy nun, you know. Uh, so um, I think Augustine, I think what Augustine is, is perfectly clear about is the dangers of sex, right, which he experienced firsthand, and how the more you engage in it, the more it binds you, and the harder it is to get out of it. And that's, uh, that's a lesson that Augustine knew 15 centuries ago and is even more relevant today with all of our access to the internet and all the people who struggle with that. Um, but I've always found, like I said, I've always found Augustine very sensible. He's, uh, he has this beautiful treatise on the goods of marriage. And he wrote that uh, in response to Jerome, who did have a very bad view of sex uh, and women. Um, or at least, uh, yeah. Um, but he writes on, on the goods of marriage. Um, and he talks about, you know, um, the goods being the sacrament, uh, fidelity, um, uh, children. Um, but in that fidelity, the way he talks about fidelity is this friendship, you know, friendship between husband and wife, you know. Um, and so I think he sees the dangers of dissociating sex from procreation, right? Um, he only had one child, even though he lived with his girlfriend for 10 years, right? So I think he understands the dangers of doing that. Um, but I think he also sees uh, the real beauty that could be there and the harmony that could be there in a home and a friendship especially one in the context of the sacramentum. Take one more question. Oh, yes. I, know, I have a student, sorry. <laughs> yes, Chase. <laughs> he, uh, he died. I guess and writes about it in the Confessions. He died young after his baptism. So that was quick. So Jenny, I could take your question. <laughs> Absolutely, it's a great it's a great question, and, and part of that is just um, my own limitations and my own uh, interest, and also what's in the confessions um, to highlight. No, it's it's a great question. Actually, I think I think Augustine would would uh, please you uh, if if we read a little bit a little bit further. Um, so one of Augustine's I think most beautiful ideas is the idea of the Christus totus, the whole Christ, Christ head and body. So he talks about the whole Christ, and he says, Christ, the head, is in heaven, his body here on earth. He says, they form one organism. You know, and when we're baptized, he says, you become not only Christians, but you become Christ. Right? So, I mean, there is this very much a strong sense. I mean, it's, it's inseparable from the sacraments, I think, because it's the sacraments that bring us into that, right? But when he talks about how that's lived out, how this lived out in humility, how this lived out in encountering the poor, right? um, how this lived out in the unity of the church. Right? Um, I think we'd find uh, a fair, uh, I think we'd find a lot of Augustine talking about deification as a confirmation to Christ. Cool. Well, thank you again for all coming out. <laughs>